to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're interested in hearing how the podcast got started and being able to experience the early episodes and series we haven't done in years, I do want to encourage you to check out our new feed, The Great Detectives of OTR Volume 1. Just go to volume1.greatdetectives.net. We have several episodes already posted along along with my Season 1 behind-the-scenes commentary. Check it all out at volume1.greatdetectives.net. Well, let's get into this week's episode of Philo Vance, the original air date, May the 31st of 1949, and this one is the Red Duck Murder Case. <laughs> Stop twirling that keychain. You're making me nervous. Easy, Joe. You're blowing your top, kid. Don't call me kid. Now, look, Eddie, I'm trying to be calm. Trying to be calm ain't easy with a guy like you. Now, tell me what happened and tell me fast. Solid. Nothing to get excited about, kid. Don't call me kid. Now, look, I'm your boss, Joe D'Angelo. You call me Mr. D'Angelo or Joe. But you don't call me kid. You get that? Okay, kid. What? You want a report? Here it is. I passed two of the $100 bills you're making in competition with the government. No trouble. You like that? Two of them, huh? That is good. Where? One of them I got rid of down at the restaurant on Green Street. No trouble. Uh-huh. The other I got rid of at the haberdashery. Guy looks the bill over good, and he gives me the change as nice as you please. We're in business, Joe. Uh, you bet your life we are. Only this local stuff is small time, see? Tell you what I want to do now, Eddie. Yeah? I want you to make contacts in different cities. Sell them the counterfeit bills I make. Can you do it? Natch. Push over. What do you want from them? 25%. I want 25 bucks a good dough for every $100 phony. Can you get it? I'm going to get more than that, kid. I'm getting 30 bucks instead of 25. Okay, I could use the other five. Yeah, maybe you can, kid. The other five goes to me. That's my commission. Don't start anything, Eddie. Remember now, you just work for me. You do like I tell you. Yeah, who takes the risks of passing the queer? You? No, me. And I'll get what I can for you here. Don't you forget, the FBI would like to know what you're doing. Now that that's settled, I think... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Georgie! Georgie, come in here! Hey, what is this? We'll find out. Come in, come in, Georgie. Really, Mr. D'Angelo, I wish you wouldn't scream my name. It's disturbing. Well, what is it you want? Georgie, uh, Eddie here is uh, getting ambitious. Hm. Might have expected something like that from him. Look at what he's wearing. The suit coat is three inches too long, that keychain is in horrible taste, and the color of that suit, midnight blue. <laughs> hey, what is this, a lesson in what I should wear? What do you want with Georgie, Joe? You'll find out. Georgie, you're a good boy. So I'm going to let you have some fun. Right now. Hey. Look on my arm. Joe, Joe, hey, Mr. D'Angelo, let go ahead. Let go, will Georgie, you? I can't hold this Joe. character all day. Hey, Joe, let me go, will you? Got it? Of course Joe. I have. Right all here. Right. Joe, let me go. I'm ready to use the... Joe, no! <laughs> Done, Mr. D'Angelo. You won't have any trouble at all from him from now on. Oh, dear. What's the matter, Georgie? Oh, nothing. It's all right. I thought for a moment I'd gotten a bit of lint from his shirt... On my suit. But, Mr. Markham, my boy is gone. And he was a good boy, Mr. Markham. I'm sure he was, Mrs. Macon, but there isn't anything I can do. Oh, you can't... I'm district attorney. You want the police department, Bureau of Missing Persons. No, no. I'll get them on the phone for you. No, 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 no. It is not them I want. 
You, you and your friend Philo Vance, I hear about Mrs. you. Mrs. Maker, I, oh, I read about the two of you, and now my Eddie is missing. You can find him, Mr. Markham. He, he's a good boy. Well, if it'll help you any to tell me about him, Mrs. Macon, go right ahead. Yeah. I'll turn the information over to the proper authorities. Uh, Mr. Markham, last night, Eddie, he does not come home. All the ways he comes home. Every night. Last night, he does not come home. Three weeks ago, he quit his job. It's a good job, Mr. Markham. He was a shipping clerk. Go ahead, Mrs. Macon. Uh, after he leave that job, he have more money than when he work. I said to him, Eddie, I said, where do you get this money? But they won't tell me. And now he's gone. Something has happened to him, Mr. Markham. You, you have got to find out where and what it is. You, you, you and Mr. Vance. You... I hardly think this is a matter of advance, Mrs. Macon, but I can promise you this. Uh, uh, I have a description of your son yeah, yes. and the photograph you brought me. Yes, yes, I'll yeah, do I... what I can to find him. You can depend on that. I'll do what I can. <laughs> Again, you're filing your nails, always filing your nails. Put that file away, Georgie. Certainly, Mr. D'Angelo. You sound upset. There's something wrong. That kid, that Eddie Macon we knocked off. Mm -hmm. We don't need him, I assure you. I'm quite capable of passing all the counterfeit bills you make and of making connections to have them passed in other cities. So why worry about him? Oh, yeah? Suppose they find his body. Suppose they trace it back to us, then what? My dear Mr. D'Angelo, don't be ridiculous. First of all, they'll never find his body. It's down at the bottom of the lake, very carefully weighed with a very heavy stone. Second of all, even if they did find it, there is nothing that will lead the police to us. Absolutely nothing. What are you going to do now? Uh, going to go to work on this press. Might as well get some of those bills moving, in case we have to blow town in a hurry. Ridiculous. We'll be here as long as we'd like. See you later. Where are you going? Out of here. I simply won't be able to stand the sound of that printing machine. Beautiful <laughs> drive, Vance. Thank you, Markham. Beautiful drive, beautiful day for golf. What more could a man want? What's wrong with a beautiful day, man? That wouldn't hurt me. <laughs> a caddy has something there, Vance. Yes, he has. <laughs> but a beautiful girl might lead to trouble. And this is no day for trouble. I'll go down to your ball, Mr. Vance. I'll be there by the time Mr. Markham shoots. I hope I hit one long enough so that I have to really walk for it. I need the exercise. Well, here goes. Well, not bad, my friend. It's right up there with mine. Come on, let's go. Right. Uh, oh, by the way, Vance, there was a woman in my office to see me this morning. Uh-oh. Quite an old woman. Her son had disappeared. From what I gathered, he was a good boy who met a wrong crowd. She was terribly worried. That's one of the things you can always depend upon a mother to do. Worry. Did you turn it over to the missing persons bureau? Yes, but they haven't uncovered anything. Oh, well, I don't imagine we should concern ourselves with it. After all, it is a beautiful day. I wonder where my shot landed. Our caddy is standing down the fairway a bit. One of us is there, no doubt. Probably both of us. Both shots were headed in the same direction. We'll see. Oh, by the way, Vance, this is a course you've never played before. There's a stream running through the fairway about 300 yards from the tee. That should be about 100 yards from where our shot landed. Water hazard in the middle of the course, eh? Definitely unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Natural hazard, I believe. But a good brassy shot will carry it over onto the green. Well, here we are. And both together, as I imagined. Uh, boy, brassy, please. Yes, sir, here you are. Thank you. There's water about 100 yards down, sir. So Mr. Markham was telling me. Water comes from Lake Ralph. We go ice skating there in the wintertime. Boy, fun. So I'd imagine. Swimming in summer, skating in winter. Oh, not much swimming, Mr. Vance. A couple of boats and ducks in the lake all the time. Funniest ducks you ever saw. What's funny about them? Well, this morning I seen them on my way here. They got red feet. Red feet, eh? Yeah. That is strange. Well, here goes a try with this brassy. Hope I get enough carry with it. I'm betting on you. <laughs> well, thanks for your confidence. There it goes. A beauty, Vance. Now, if I can only duplicate that shot. If I were you, I would, Markham. Principally because this is the last hole we'll have time to play. Nonsense. We're playing all day. I don't think you'll want to play after what I have to tell you. Oh, what is it, Vance? You see, in the event that the missing Eddie Macon was stabbed, I think I know where his body is. Well, 
Well, Vance, the police driver found Eddie Macon's body at the bottom of Lake Ralph, and it'll be brought to the surface any minute now. But how did you know it would be there? The clue of the red ducks, Markham. Remember what the caddy told us? The only thing that would account for red feet on ducks would be blood in the water. And blood in the water could come from a body if it had been stabbed. Wait a minute, Vance, please. If there were blood on the water, it would have been noticed, wouldn't it? Certainly. But the blood became dissipated in and by the water, Markham. Only before it had, the ducks swam over the spot where the body was located, got blood on their feet, and then went on land. (laughs) I'm enjoying this, Vance. You're even able to trace the movements of ducks. (laughs) What a man. Well, it's reasonably simple. On land, the water from the ducks' feet would dry, but the blood would cake and be retained in the webbing. I suppose that's right. In fact, I know it's right now. Now, we've got men going all through those bushes on shore here looking for some tie-up with the crime. I hope they find something. Merely getting the body will tell us nothing, I'm afraid. I'm going to enjoy working on this case even more than I usually enjoy working on a murder case. Why? Because the killers spoil our golf game? Yes, that and the fact that we're not going to have very much to work with, if anything. You're a strange man, Vance. The tougher the problem, the greater pleasure for you. (laughs) Most of the time, it's the other way. That's Sergeant Heath's voice. Over here, Heath. From the tone of the sergeant's voice, I'd say he'd found something. I certainly hope so. Hi, Mr. Markham. Well, hello, Vance. You're here on this case, too, huh? That's right. It's because of Vance that we're here on this case, Heath. What's up? Well, one of my men was beating around the bushes, came up with this glove. It's all bloodstained, but all identification's been removed. Uh, let me see that, will you, Heath? Sure, here you are. Yeah, I do. Hey, what are you turning it inside out for? I told you all the marks have been removed. Yes, you did. Oh, even the button's been yanked off. Guess it had the name of the maker on it. Well, that's true, of course, but this glove is very informative just the same. What do you mean, Vance? Well, for one thing, it hasn't lain in the bushes very long, which means it probably was thrown away by the murderer of Eddie Macon, who's only been missing 24 hours. Well, so what? What good is that if we can't tell anything about the murderer? We can tell a lot about him from this glove, Heath. Huh? If I were you, I'd send out an alarm for a tall, thin man about six foot two, immaculate in dress, left-handed, carries a walking stick, and, uh... Yes, he's blonde. Ah. Vance, how in the world do you know that? Let's get in your car and drive over to see Eddie Macon's mother, Markham. I'll tell you all about it on the way. Well, I'm waiting, Vance. Sorry, Markham, I was just thinking of something, but it doesn't matter now. What you want to know is how I got the picture of our murder suspect just from looking at a blood-stained glove. That's right. Well, it's reasonably simple. The glove was a large size, leading me to assume that the murderer was a tall man. However, the fingers on the glove were very narrow, hence the killer was thin. But the way he dressed and the fact that he was left-handed and carried a stick... Most men who carry a stick are meticulous in dress, Markham. And the glove was a little worn between the index finger and the inside of the thumb. Only a stick would cause a worn spot such as I noticed in that particular place. Granting all that, what about the fact that he was left-handed, that he was blonde, that he was well-dressed? Left-handed? Well, the glove we found was a left glove. And apparently, he carried his stick in his left hand. Blonde? I saw a very small blonde hair on the inside of the glove. The police laboratory would have detected that, I'm sure. And what about the business of his being well-dressed? There were traces of liquid nail polish on the tip of the inside of the fingers, Markham. Apparently, after his most recent manicure, he was in a hurry and didn't give the polish a chance to dry. That's all there is to it. That and the fact that most men who carry a stick are (laughs) well-dressed. It certainly sounds simple the way you say it. And it's just as well the explanation's over, because here's Mrs. Megan's house. Oh, uh, she knows about her son. Yes, Heath telephoned her. I imagine she's all broken up. She was almost hysterical when she came into my office to report him missing. We'll soon find out. Coming, Mark. Of course. What do you expect to find here, Vance? If we're lucky, Mrs. Macon will be able to tell us which of her son's friends answers the description I feel fits the murderer. That'll certainly simplify this case. Yes, it will. And it's one reason that I don't believe we'll find anything. The bell, Markham. Right. There's one thing I hate. It's dealing with hysterical women, Vance. We may have a surprise in store for us there, too, Markham. Yes, Oh, it is Mr. Markham. Yes, hello, Mrs. Macon. This is Philo Vance. You remember you asked me to get him to help find your son. Yes, and you would not do it. It wouldn't have done any good, Mrs. Macon. Your son was already dead when you came to see Mr. Markham. Perhaps. What is it you want? We have a description of a man we believe might be your son's murderer. We'd like to know if you knew such a man. What does he look like? He's tall, blonde, dresses very well, carries a walking stick, quite thin. I don't know anybody like that. And neither did my son. You can't help us? You could not help me. I cannot help you. Good day, gentlemen. (laughs) 
This is District Attorney Markham. The Red Duck murder case began with the finding of the body of Eddie Macon, who had been stabbed. From a glove discovered near the scene of the crime, Philo Vance has constructed a detailed picture of the killer. So far, we have been unable to find a man answering the description. At this time, he might be almost anywhere. In a taxi, in a park, in a shop. Come, come, my man. Please, just wrap it up and give it to me, and I'll take it with me. I have my car outside. Just one moment, sir, please, if you don't mind. One moment? What for? I'm in a hurry. Yes, but you've given me a hundred-dollar bill. I'll have to get the change from the back of the shop. I won't be but a moment, sir. Very well, but hurry. I don't have all day. Fine thing. Shopkeeper who can't keep change for a hundred in his register. Police headquarters. Hello, this is Bailey at Bailey's Men's Shop on Main Street. A man is in the shop, tall, blonde, and he's carrying a stick. He just gave me a hundred-dollar bill. It's one of those counterfeits we were told to watch out for. Good. Stall him there a few minutes. We'll be right over. Right. Sorry to have kept you waiting, sir. But I'll have your change in just a moment. Very cute, weren't you? But you don't trap me. I'm getting out of here. What? Hey, you, stop! Stop! What's going on? Going Excuse on. me, please. Well, oh, pardon me, please. Oh. Stop him, somebody! Oh. Somebody stop that man in the roaster there! Oh. Hey, you! You in the car, stop! Okay. Get off, you fool, get off! Oh, no, my friend, I'm hanging under this door. I warn you to get off. This gun will change your mind. Oh! Get off, or I'll slam it down on your other hand. There! Oh! Now, off! Oh. <laughs> Markham speaking. This is Vance, Markham. Vance, I've been calling you all over town. We're hot on the trail of the blonde killer. He's tied up with a counterfeit ring. Did you know that? No. Tell me about it. He tried to pass a counterfeit bill, and the shopkeeper almost grabbed him. He answers your description perfectly, by the way. Good. It isn't so very good. We still don't know where to locate him. Well, that's why I called you. I can tell you where he lives. What? Sergeant Heath and I made a very thorough canvas of custom tailors, better type haberdashers, and barber shops, and finally found our blonde friend's manicurist. I asked Heath to let me take it from there. Well, that's fine with me, but do we grab our blonde counterfeiter now? No, Markham. We're not ready for that yet. You meet me at the address I'll give you in a moment, and we'll make plans to break up the whole counterfeit ring. We'll break that up and get our murderer at the same time. Please turn off that printing press. Uh, take it easy, Georgie. You file your nails, it gets on my nerves. My press gets on yours. Same diff. Please turn it off, won't you? Okay, okay. Only every time it makes a noise, we make another load of dough, Georgie. Don't forget that. I know. And money is terribly important. It buys clothes, handmade shirts, this Hamburg hat. I... Yes, I must have money, Joe. Oh, you're going to roll in it in another week, Georgie. <laughs> I yes, know, Mr. Uh... D'Angelo. You and I are very clever, aren't we? We're the best, Georgie. The best. (laughs) I make them, you pass them. When there's trouble, we handle it. Mm -hmm. You should have seen the face of the fellow I pushed off my car. Uh, Any chance of his tracing the car, Georgie? None at all. I had a rag over the license plates. Horribly dirty rag. Did an awful clean job for us. Don't forget that. No, that's true. Mr. D'Angelo, nobody is any closer to us than they were before we killed Eddie Macon. We're completely in the clear, and we'll stay that way until we leave town. Right? Right. (laughs) One more week, and we'll have enough counterfeit money made to start our own treasury department. Then, a month to drop it off in different cities. And then you know where I'm going, Georgie? No. Where? (laughs) I'm going to spend the rest of my life on Easy Street. Any answer yet, Markham? No, Vance. I'm still holding the phone and the operator's still checking for the address. 
Quite a nice apartment the blonde killer has, isn't it? Excellent taste. I'm still not quite sure how you found it, Vance. Well, Markham, his type of man had to have his nails done very often, usually by the same manicurist. Sergeant Heath and I found a manicurist at one of the better hotels who had a customer answering our description. She once had to go to his apartment to do his nails and remembered the address. It was as simple as that. <laughs> Vance, everything is simple once you set to work on it. Oh. I sure wish this operator would answer. I wish our blonde friend had been here when we broke into his apartment. All we found was that telephone number on his pad. What happens after the operator gives us the name and address belonging to that number? It all depends on who the number belongs to. We think I'm it... sorry to keep you waiting, oh, wait sir. Minute, it's all right, miss. I'm still here. The number is listed under the name of Joseph D'Angelo Printer at 484 Jean Street. D'Angelo Printer. Thank you very much. Vance, I know. I heard. Well, it's all starting to tie up now, Markham. You get Heath and a squad of men. I'm going to 484 Jean Street. <laughs> What's the matter, Georgie? What's going on? We've got to get out of here. Oh, wait till I turn off this machine. Oh, what is this? I just called the shop where I have my nails done. I have to make an appointment. You yeah, see, never I mind all that. What happened? The girl told me a man was asking questions about me. Said he was a friend of mine. She told him where I lived and... Joe, I have this phone number written on a pad. Oh, you jerk. Well, come on. Let's break all this stuff and throw Very it in well. the melting pot. Yes. Anybody comes here two minutes from now won't find a thing. All that lovely money, too. Every hunk of paper in a joint. Now, come on, hurry. Right. The guy who asked those questions might be here any minute now. Yes. Take the lid off that stove down there. All right. This money lying around isn't dry yet. I'll get ink all over my hands. So what? Take off your coat. We've got work to do. I'll get ink on this beautiful shirt. I, I just had it made. Take that coat off and step on it. Now, here. Dump these bills into the fire. All right. I'm going to take the press apart and melt down those plates. Oh, my beautiful shirt. It'll be ruined. I'll get the money out of the way. One more trip ought to make it. I'll bang this press into so many pieces, nobody will know what it was. Couldn't we save the plates? Those beautifully engraved plates on the table. They go next. Right into the fire, pretty boy. How you doing? I'm... I've destroyed all the money. Good. Ah, i got to go to work on these. I wouldn't work well, on anything if I were you. Georgie, this must be the guy who asked questions. The knife, Georgie, the knife. Only how'd he get in? The door was open and I walked in. The knife, Georgie, use the knife. The knife, Mr. Oh, no, you don't get him, Georgie. I'll hold his arm. No, you don't either. Oh. Trying to do that more often. You'll never do anything again, ever. This knife Drop will... It. Drop that no, knife. No, my arm, my Drop arm. Drop it. Let go. The... go. I'll, I'll drop it. <sighs> but I'll get out of here. You'll never catch me. Never saw a man so wrong in my life. I... Your friend's out cold, and I'm holding you here until the police come. Stop it! Stop it and let me alone! You stay right here against this table. No, oh, no you don't! No! Don't try to get away. You got a gun, eh? Stop it! You're breaking my back! Yes. Breaking my back! You're I breaking tell you. my heart! I'll. Oh. 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 Oh, thank you, Mr. D'Angelo. He didn't hit you as hard as you thought. Uh, I got a tough chin. Now listen, Georgie. That guy I just slugged is Philo Vance. That means the cops will be here soon. Now, come on, help me break up this engraving plate on the table, and when the cops get here, nobody will know what we've been up to. There won't be a trace of anything. But what about Vance? He's yours, yours and your knife's. Good. In that case, let's hurry and break up these plates. I can take care of this alone. You go on over and lock the outside door so we don't have no more company. Sure, I'll do that, Mr. D'Angelo. <clears throat> All locked, Mr. D'Angelo. What do we do now? Now... Nah. Just about taking care of these plates. <clears throat> that does it. Now we get to work on Vance. Open up in there. Open up. Well, cops, they're breaking in the door, Mr. D'Angelo. What should we do? Get out of here. The back way and fast. Come no, on. no, not yet. I've got to take care of Mr. Vance. I've got to be... Oh. Come on, men. All right, oh. both of you. Hold it right where you are. Take your uh, hands you off You'll have to take care of Mr. Vance. We could have been out of here. Sergeant, Sergeant, I hate to go to yours. Move. All right, Mr. Markham. Hey, look at Vance on the floor. Vance. Vance, are you all right? Okay. Vance, yeah. come on, you're going with us. What for? What do you got on us? We saw this guy break in and we slugged him. We thought he was a stick-up guy. Mr. Markham? Don't try anything funny, D'Angelo. We know you've been counterfeiting and we can prove it. Yeah, how? See any phony dough around? Any plates? Markham, Mr. D'Angelo is right. Vance, can you get up all right? I'll be all right in a minute. What I was saying is that Mr. D'Angelo is right. There's practically no evidence of counterfeiting in this place now. Hey, say, what did I tell you? Yes. Do you see what Mr. D'Angelo told you? I said there was practically no evidence. 
Turn around, my blonde friend. Turn around and show the district attorney indisputable evidence that not only was there counterfeiting going on here, but that you and Mr. D'Angelo were doing it. Not much to discuss in this case, is there, Markham? Uh, Just one thing, Vance. Our blonde friend George in the back of his shirt. Oh, that. Well, I suspected that D'Angelo and George would break up their plates if they succeeded in overpowering me. So, before they did, I forced George in his clean white shirt up against the engraving plate. So, when he turned around, you saw several counterfeit impressions (laughs) of $100 bills on it. (laughs) Yes, we did. And I don't mind telling you we needed that evidence to make sure that that was the end of the two counterfeiters. George confessed rather easily, I understand. Yes, yes, his type always does, Vance. He admitted he killed Eddie Macon. Well, then, that little device of mine not only meant the end of the two counterfeiters, but also the end of the Red Duck murder case. Welcome back. This reminded me of so many of the later Boston Blackie uh, stories, where a criminal needlessly complicates his uh, enterprise with a completely unnecessary murder. Because the boss simply said, I want 25 cents on the dollar for the counterfeit money. And Eddie's like, okay, I will get you 25 cents, but I'm going to be selling this for 30 cents so that I get this commission. And so then uh, he has Eddie murdered. That was a very quick escalation. Now he's got a body to deal with, and the guy he has working in Eddie's place is completely unsuited to the task. Let's just be blunt. The guy is conspicuous as all get out. I'm all for people having their own look and their own style, and I think I'm... A pretty physically unique specimen that would be pretty memorable, but I would say that tend to make me a pretty lousy criminal. Even if I were to abandon all of my ethical and moral objections to crime, and this guy, yeah, this guy would definitely stick out. And that's even made worse by the fact we're talking about passing $100 bills, which are still not particularly common uh, today. You think about the prices in 1949 and someone going in flashing a hundred around. This is one of those cases where the criminals were going to be caught. Just got to see how Vance actually did it. Uh, also have to wonder why in the world a magazine writer would feature Vance and Markham as like this crime-solving team. Because other than official authority, Markham does not contribute much to the solving of these cases. I mean, I can imagine how the interview would have gone. So, tell me, uh, Mr. Markham, other than being the district attorney, what do you do? Well, I ask Vance questions. Like, really deep, complex questions that 
really gets his gears going? No, more like questions that a young child who had no idea what happened in crime would ask. And is that all? No, I also provide information. And Vance might say, oh, Markham, yeah, this is a reporter who is giving us an interview, Vance. Uh, I kind of knew that. Uh, he's been giving us an interview. Well, yeah, I tell him things he already knows. Like if we go to a golf course that he hasn't been to before, I tell him he hasn't been to the golf course before. And the reporter might be like, okay, so why do you tell him that he hasn't been to a golf course that he hasn't been to? Just in case he doesn't know that he hasn't been to the golf course. You know, he's going up to the tee thinking, this is the golf course I've been to, and I, I've just got to tell him, no, this is not one that you have been to. And yes, I'm po poking a little bit of fun at Markham and his uh, statement during the golf game. But if I'm going to fault this episode, I'm going to really do it. It's going to be about the titular clue. This is the red doc murder case and in this case the body was found at the bottom of a lake by divers so if i'm understanding this correctly our murderer after stabbing the victim secured the body weighed it down somehow and tossed the body into the lake and weighed it down so it went to the bottom and then the next morning two ducks somehow interact with blood from the victim's body to such a degree that it turns their feet red. Now, some stuff sounds a, a bit iffy. Like, yeah, I know that there can be the appearance of bleeding after death, but could Eddie's body have really bled at the bottom of a lake, way down there, and to such a degree that if ducks stepped in it or in any way interacted with it with their feet that it would turn them red. That may be possible. I am willing to consider the possibility that it may not usually be something that happens, but that George didn't properly pack the body before tossing it into the lake. I mean, he's not been shown to be good at any other aspect of his job other than killing people, so why would this be any different? But I think the bigger thing that I'm dubious about is the feet. For when I've seen ducks dive, uh, they've dived headfirst and then turned back and used their flippers to propel them upwards. It's certainly believable that a duck could dive to the bottom of a lake, but it kind of se would seem odd if it would be the feet that got so drenched in blood that an observer would say the color had uh, changed to red. So I'm dubious. I I'm careful after that whole herringbone fiasco. Maybe I'm being a dense Sergeant Heath here. Or maybe I'm like in another series, Inspector Thorne. I don't look too bright, but I might actually have a point. So if anyone has any insights, feel free to let me know. Well, listen our comments and feedback now. And we have a comment from Jonathan who writes, Once again, I'm really enjoying your podcast so much. Here is a serious question. It appears to me that in all the radio mysteries that I've heard so far, the good guy always wins. The bad guy is always caught. Are, are there any where the villain escapes or gets away with it? If so, maybe uh, there could be a villain event during Halloween. Uh, thanks. Well, thanks for the question. Stories where the bad guy gets away with it are very rare in old-time radio. There are a few instances that do stand out. For a couple of episodes of Dragnet, actually. One was the big ruling, 1955 episode where Friday had failed to keep up with changes in the law, and so he and Smith illegally obtained evidence, even though they didn't know it was illegal at the time. The case ended up getting tossed and the criminal walked. There was also a, a case where a big mystery of how a suspect disappeared without a trace was posted on Dragnet, 
And at the end of the episode, we never found out because the police never figured it out. End of episode. And then we have cases where the criminal is found out, the case is solved, but the detective lets them go free, substituting their own personal sense of justice for uh, whatever might happen officially. There were a couple of home stories like this, and one I know for sure was adapted was the Adventure of the Devil's Foot. I can't think of any other detective programs that uh, did that right off. There might be an episode here or there, but I'm not aware of them. Now, in terms of actually getting away with it, Scandal in Bohemia is a story where Sherlock Holmes is bested by Irene Neadler. And then there was a sequel to that that was made for radio in which Irene Adler's daughter also gets over on Sherlock Holmes called The Second Generation. And of course, you're not talking something serious like murder. I forget what went on in that particular case, but I do know that Holmes uh, ended up being uh, taken again. You can find stuff that's outside the realm of detective fiction. Uh, there was a Screen Guild uh, Players adaptation of uh, the movie Raffles. And certainly there's, you know, true crime stuff that's, you know, unsolved. You know, there was the whole series Somebody Knows. Where every crime uh, that they covered on that program was never solved. I think we can actually retitle the series, Somebody Knows But Nobody's Telling. There are things like that. I would have no interest in doing those sort of things as like some sort of special week or vacation week or anything like that. I mean, could you imagine uh, me saying this coming up next week, no justice will be done. Every crime will go unpunished and society will not be righted. So listen in. I mean, it sounds like the news. I don't particularly care for bad guys get away endings. I can respect you know, depending on how it's done, if that ending's done. But it's not something that I particularly enjoy. And I certainly wouldn't want to do a week of it. So it's an interesting idea, but just would not be something I would uh, enjoy doing. But I appreciate uh, the uh, email. Now let's go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thanks so much to Stephen, Patreon supporter since March 2020, currently supporting the program at the rookie level, of $2 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, Stephen. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this program on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We'll be back next Thursday with another episode of Philo Vance. Join us back here tomorrow for yours truly, Johnny Dollar, where... <laughs>
I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.